Hello, and welcome to the session, the second session of the day, uh, which will be given by Shri Khan about arithmetic circles. As you break. <laughs> right. So, mics all the way. Okay, good. All right. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I'll be talking about uh, algebraic slash arithmetic uh, circuits. Um, okay, so just to uh, do a brief setup. Um, so I should say there'd be a big overlap with uh, Christian's talk in the morning. Uh, so right, he's already introduced a lot of stuff uh, that will be useful here. So I'm thankful to him for that. And uh, but I made slides, so I have to go through them anyways. <laughs> so we'll do it again. I, and maybe I'll say something slightly different. Uh, okay. Okay. So, okay, so what's the basic setup? So uh, just to recall, uh, when you're talking about algebraic circuits, we're talking about computational problems that can be written as um, multivariate polynomials over some field, right? So your inputs are some uh, <coughs> n elements of some field there, and you want to compute some polynomial of these things, right? And uh, that's a basic problem. So now this seems, may seem like a restrictive setup, but uh, many interesting computational problems can be written this way. So we have our uh, sort of standard suspects, the determinant, the permanent, uh, matrix multiplication, etc. So all of these uh, computational problems, uh, very interesting, important ones, have the property that they can be stated in this language, right? So the determinant is, of course, uh, a multivariate polynomial. The permanent is a multivariate polynomial. Matrix multiplication is a collection of multivariate polynomials. So all of these can be captured in this general language. Right? And this is the kind of problems that we are interested in. So we're interested in polynomial problems. Okay? So I should say that throughout the talk, I'm only going to be dealing with polynomials whose degrees are somewhat small. Right? So the degree is an important uh, parameter when it comes to polynomials. And this entire theory is built, about, built around polynomials whose degrees are themselves polynomial. Okay? Uh, so that's the setup. So the determinant, permanent, etc. Every all of the polynomials I've uh, written down on the slide definitely have this feature, and these are the only kinds of polynomials we're going to be worried about. Okay. Good. So when you want to compute polynomials and you're looking at algorithms for computing polynomials, what are the most natural algorithms that you would think about, right? Well, polynomials are defined using well sum and products. So you think about algorithms that use sums and products to compute them, right? And this is what an algebraic circuit is. Right? So uh, Christian didn't formally define an algebraic circuit in the morning, so I'll just go through it. Uh, so it's just like a Boolean circuit, which we've seen a few times already. Only instead of ands and ors, we have uh, sums and products. That's it. Okay. So formally speaking, you'll have to, uh, uh, we, we look at uh, something like a directed acyclic graph. Uh, the leaves of this graph are labeled by the input variables, right? which take values in the field. And then you have uh, products. So the leaves, or, right, the leaves are not just labeled by variables, they can also be labeled by constants from the underlying field. Then you have product gates that compute products of their inputs. You have sum gates that can compute sums of their inputs, or more generally, linear combinations of their inputs. Okay? And this way, every sort of gate in the circuit computes some sort of polynomial in the underlying variables. Right? And you have one or more output gates for the circuit, and the, out, the polynomials computed by the output gates of the circuit are the polynomials computed by the circuit. So this is what, in general, an algebraic circuit does. So for example, this circuit should be reasonably clear. So uh, here, the minus 1 along this edge indicates that the uh, second plus gate, the one on the right, computes x1, x2, minus x2, x3. So it's computing a general linear combination of its inputs. And the uh, scalars that sort of give you this linear combination appear along the edges uh, that are input to the sum gate. OK. So is this uh, OK with everybody? Does it make sense? OK, I should uh, say, yeah, feel free to stop me at any time. Uh, I think at least the first half will be fairly uh, slow paced and a lot of time for questions. OK, so, um, so this is a notion of an algebraic circuit. And whenever you have a computational model like an algebraic circuit or a Boolean circuit or whatever, you want to have notions of efficiency. So here, the main notion of efficiency that we want, that we want to look at is the size of the circuit. Okay? And the size of the circuit is just the number of edges in this graph. Okay, so there are uh, two reasonable ways of defining size, the number of edges and number of vertices. And uh, they're off from each other by a quadratic factor. So I'm always going to look at the number of edges. Okay, the number of edges in this graph. So in, in particular, for example, in the explicit example given here, the size is 8 because 8 edges. So another reasonable notion of complexity is the depth of the circuit, which is the longest input to output path. So here the depth is 2. So this is some sort of measure of the inductive sort of complexity of the circuit. 
okay so small depth circuits somehow very efficient parallel algorithms whereas large depth circuits are uh, quite complex okay so that's an algebraic circuit all right I also want to look at some other uh, models of computation. So when I've defined this notion of an algebraic circuit and we define it in a graph theoretic way, it's reasonable to look at you know, uh, circuits where the graphs are somewhat special and look at the kind of polynomials they, that they can compute. So one such computational model is what is called an algebraic formula. Right? So the only difference between an algebraic circuit and an algebraic formula is that the underlying graph has to be a tree. Okay, so that's uh, what an algebraic formula is. So this is, for example, is an algebraic formula. But more than that, they're actually very natural objects. So I want to say that a little bit, especially in the context of algebraic complexity. Right? When you write down a polynomial on a piece of paper, you're writing an expression down for it, that's an algebraic formula. Really, that's what it is. Of course, you can represent it as a tree, but that's really what it is. It's a very natural kind of thing to look at. Right? So formula is just an algebraic expression. So for example, uh, the polynomial that I've written down here, x1, x2 plus x2, x3, could be written alternatively as maybe x2 times x1 plus x3, and that's its own algebraic formula. Right? Yeah. That. Okay, so algebraic formulas are just algebraic expressions. The size of the formula, the number of edges in it, is equivalent more or less to the size of this expression. And this is a nice model of computation that we'll be looking at. Okay. Right? And it should be clear that algebraic formulas are sub cases of algebraic circuits. So they're at most, in computational power, they're uh, sort of weaker, at most as strong as algebraic circuits. Okay, so these are two interesting computational models. And intermediate to these two, there is a third model that we look at, which is the notion of an algebraic, oh, sorry, I wanted to say this before getting to algebraic branching program. So uh, special kinds of algebraic formulas will be uh, sort of of interest to us also. So. As I said, algebraic formulas are simply expressions, algebraic expressions. So special kinds of expressions will be especially interesting. So here are a few special kinds of expressions. So sigma pi formulas. Okay, so what's a sigma pi formula? It's the normal way in which we write down a polynomial. When we write a polynomial, we write it as a sum of a product of monomials. And this kind of expression is what I'll call a sigma pi formula. Okay. So slightly more complicated than sigma pi formulas are sigma pi sigma formulas, where instead of just looking at sums of products of variables, you look at sums of products of sums of variables or sums of products of linear functions. So that's slightly more complicated expressions, but they're also kind of interesting. And then you can look at sigma pi, sigma pi, and so on. Okay. So all of these are sort of uh, subcases of formulas, but they will be in particular interesting for certain sort of statements we want to make. Okay. So just to be clear that we are okay with this notation, Hopefully you can all understand this sentence. It says that any polynomial, any polynomial whatsoever, let's say of degree d, has a sigma pi formula. Right? So any polynomial can be written as a sum of product of monomials. So it has a sigma pi formula of size the number of monomials of degree d. Okay? So how many monomials of degree d do we have? At most d do we have or n variables? It's given by some binomial coefficient. And therefore every polynomial of degree d, no matter how complex the polynomial is, always has a sigma pi formula of this size, okay? And I'll call this the trivial representation for the polynomial, okay? So this is just sort of a sanity check, saying that our model is complete. We can compute every possible polynomial, and now it's just a matter of complexity to understand how much size is required to compute each polynomial. All right. Okay, so we've seen algebraic circuits and algebraic formulas. I also want to define an intermediate model between these two, which is uh, what I'll call an algebraic branching program or what is known as an algebraic branching program. Okay. So my plan was to spend about 15 minutes introducing this thing, but uh, Christian already defined it, but I'll go through it anyway. So uh, what is an algebraic branching program? So briefly speaking, it's defined by a kind of a combinatorial object, which is just a directed acyclic graph. But the directed acyclic graph is very different from the directed acyclic graph in a circuit. So it's, it, it works very differently here. So you have a, a sort of a layered directed acyclic graph. So it's helpful to think of it in uh, layers, though it doesn't have to be. Uh, so imagine that your vertices come in layers and edges go from one layer to the next. Right. And so you have a, a, a DAG like this with a source S and a sink T. And every edge of this directed acyclic graph is labeled by a linear polynomial. Right. So every edge E has a label, which is a linear polynomial. And now the polynomial computed by this entire object is this uh, sort of complicated looking thing. So it's the sum over all parts going from S to T, right? 
And for each path, you take the product of the linear functions along the path. So you sum over all paths going from s to t, you take the product of the linear functions along the path. So this is, for example, a sigma pi sigma formula, right? So it's a sum of product of linear functions. I'm defining the polynomial this way, okay? But it's a very big uh, sigma pi sigma formula. So uh, I know all of you have seen this definition before, but if you haven't seen it before, it's, uh, it's uh, sort of helpful to think about what happens when these uh, linear functions are all distinct variables. Okay, so imagine that you have a graph and these linear functions are in fact just distinct variables. And imagine that they just take values zeros and one, that are zero or one. Okay, so as you get a zero one input, what you're really getting is like a subgraph of the graph G, right? So it's zero one, so it's turning off or turning on an input. And what this polynomial computes on that subgraph is the number of S to T paths. Okay, right? So if these linear functions are distinct variables, then uh, distinct variables are just taking zero one values. As you take the product of the variables along the path, you're either going to get zero or one, and you're going to get one only if all the edges along that path survive. And so what this is going to do is just count the number of s to t paths in a given subgraph of your original graph. Okay. So this should give you sort of some intuition for this model. It is closely tied to uh, things like the Boolean reachability question and counting things like uh, paths in directed graphs. Okay. So the algebraic branching program model is sort of uh, built in a way that ensures that reachability is sort of the hardest problem for it. And it's sort of the, an the algebraic analog of the complexity class uh, NL. Okay, so that's a basic idea. All right, so that's algebraic branching program. So just uh, go through a couple of examples. So uh, as I said, I already made the slide, so I have them. Okay, so uh, for example, if your graph is just a single path, uh, that's all it is. Right. And now, uh, suppose your graph is something a little more complicated, then uh, your algebraic branching program would have to sum over all the paths from the source to the sink in this graph. So for example, here I guess there are, I don't know, four paths, so you get four monomials. Something like this. Okay. All right, so, and I also want to sort of uh, uh, spend some time on a connection that Amir already pointed out in the morning when we were talking about algebraic branching programs, is that this is closely related to the problem of multiplying matrices. Okay. So again, this should not be a surprise, right? So because reachability in the Boolean world is sort of connected to Boolean matrix multiplication. So it's not surprising that reachability in the algebraic world is connected to matrix multiplication. And that turns out to be the case, and it's something that you can very easily verify on this small example. So for example, you can check that this polynomial is exactly the polynomial you get when you multiply these three matrices. Right? And it's not hard to verify, so uh, maybe you can just do it. So it, it, the combinatorics, that, or the computations that you do in computing the, this, this matrix part is exactly the kind of thing you do in summing over these parts in the graph G2. So in fact, these two polynomials are identical. Okay. So you can write the polynomial in terms of this graph combinatorially. Or you can write this polynomial as a product of matrices, sort of more algebraically, and these are equivalent. So any questions about this at all? So they're equivalent even if the graph is not sort of nicely layered? And all right, so if the graph is not nicely layered, it's not clear how to define these matrices. So the first matrix, for example, corresponds to the first layer of edges, etc. But in general, you can always ensure that the graph is layered by sort of blowing up the size of things a little bit. So yeah, you can assume the graph is layered and then there is a sort of a one-to-one -one correspondence. Any other questions? Okay, so this was the simple example here, but there is a more general connection as I sort of said. So uh, in general, an algebraic branching program that's layered, uh, you can always write it as a sort of a product of matrices. And a more general algebraic program will not just have variables along its edges like we had in the previous example, but it will have general linear functions and it may have certain edges that don't appear and whatnot. All, of, all such algebraic branching programs can be converted into these kinds of matrix products in a very simple way. So for example, if I have an algebraic, a generic algebraic branching program of this form and I want to convert it to a matrix product, what I do is, for example, for the second layer, I define a matrix where the matrix, the entries of the matrix correspond to sort of pairs of vertices on this side and this side. And the entry corresponding to vertex U on the left and vertex V on the right will be either the linear function labeling the edge uv, if there is an edge, right? And if there's no edge, you just don't have anything. So you just put zero, 
matrices. So that's the generic sort of conversion from linear functions to matrices, so from algebraic branching programs to matrix products. And if you do things this way, the product of these matrices, okay, so just to be clear, you start with a row vector and you end with a column vector. So the product is going to be like a one by one matrix, and that one by one matrix is going to compute the same polynomial as the algebraic branching program. All right, so yeah, so just like for uh, circuits and formulas, we also have uh, a size of an algebraic branching program. And again, here you can take the number of vertices and the number of edges, and they are sort of slightly, subtly different. But I'm going to stick with the number of vertices. So the number of vertices in the algebraic branching program is my notion of size. Okay. Right, so we've introduced three computational models, right? So there are formulas, circuits, and algebraic branching programs. And corresponding to these, we can define complexity classes, algebraic complexity classes, and start of, sort of now start doing complexity theory. Okay. So this is a non-uniform model of computation. So in general, I'll be talking about computing sequences of polynomials, not just one polynomial. Okay. So suppose now I have a family, a sequence of polynomials, Pn. So usually there'll be a one polynomial for every n, but sometimes there isn't. Like, for example, if you take the determinant polynomial, so it's, there's not just one for every n, there's one for every squared number of variables. But roughly, there is, there's one reasonably frequently. So that's a family of polynomials for me. Right? And so now let's define complexity classes. So the complexity class VF, okay, here the V stands for Valiant, who started the study of uh, the algebraic complexity theory of uh, computational complexity of polynomials. And F stands for formulas. So VF is the family, refers to a sequence of polynomials that have polynomial sized formulas. Yes, we have polynomial sized. And similarly, you can talk about VBP, which is uh, polynomial families that have polynomial sized ABPs, and more generally, VP, polynomial sequence of polynomials that have polynomial sized circuits. Okay. And we have this inclusion of complexity classes. <coughs> so the complexity class VF is contained in the complexity class VBP, and the complexity class VBP is contained in the complexity class VP. So these inclusions are not hard to see. In fact, we've probably done one or two of them, but let's go through it anyway. So it's clear that VF is contained in VP. That's just the definition, right? Circuits, formulas are special cases of circuits. So VF is contained in VP. It's not hard to see that VBP is contained in VP, right? So everything that has a small branching program has a small circuit. And the reason for this is that branching, program essentially, branching programs essentially correspond to matrix multiplication. And definitely, we can do matrix multiplication in polynomial time. And that same algorithm can be written down as an algebraic circuit, which shows that VBP is contained in VP. Right. What is slightly subtle and not immediate is that uh, VF, the complexity class corresponding to polynomials with small formulas, is contained in VBP, with small algebraic branching programs. Okay. So this is not completely easy to see. I'm not going to go through the proof of it, but I just want to give you a little bit of intuition Again, VBP sort of corresponds to a complexity class NL. It's like a non-uniform version of NL. And VF is sort of the non-uniform version of, I'm sorry, non-uniform algebraic version of uh, NC1. And we know NC1 is contained in NL. So you should expect that VF is contained in VBP. And indeed, that turns out to be the case. The actual construction is not hard. It's sort of a, you start with the formula and you construct a branching program sort of inductively. Yes? So like, some should be parallel edges and product should be sequential edges. That's exactly right. So what Russell is saying is that every time you want to compute the sum of two polynomials that have small algebraic branching programs, you sort of just compose them in parallel by identifying the sources and the sinks. And if you want to compute the product of two formulas, two polynomials that have small algebraic branching programs, you sort of compose them in series by identifying the source of one with the sink of the other. OK, so it's sort of not hard to do combinatorially, but uh, so I'm not going to get into it. I think it's reasonably intuitive that we can uh, assume this and move on. Okay. But any questions about what I've said at all at this point? Yeah. Just one question about branching programs. Uh, so like, I, I guess especially with the matrix multiplication, it seems like an actual generalization of just regular branching programs. Yeah. But um, why put linear functionals on the edges as opposed to just variables? Like, why is that the natural generalization? OK, so why put linear functions? Um, so you could have just variables. Uh, it, it wouldn't make a difference in the sense that the size would blow up by a factor of n or something. So it really doesn't make a difference. It's just that usually, at least for me, uh, when you're talking about algebraic models of computation, it's nice to have them closed under linear transformations. Uh, 
So, I mean, so if you do a linear transformation of the underlying set of variables, I would like to have the same size, and then linear functions make sense. Other than that, I don't think there's a reason. Linear functions for you are a fine function, right? Linear functions for me are polynomials of degree at most one, so they can have constant terms, yes. Is there an analog of uh, Barrington? Result? Sorry? Is there an analog of Barrington? Yes, there is an analog of Barrington's result. Uh, in fact, I think Christian mentioned it briefly in the morning. Yeah, so every uh, algebraic formula has an algebraic branching program of width 3. And this is due to Benor and Cleave. Yeah, I don't have this, unfortunately. But let me write down uh, the authors of this result. That's what it's known. I don't think it predates it. It's after. OK. So, OK, so. All right, so let me carry on. So now, what's the question, right? So we're here trying to prove lower bound. So what's the lower bound question for this? Uh, so the, the question is, of course, uh, are there polynomials or polynomial families that do not have small formulas, that, that do not have small ABPs, or do not have small circuits? Right, so that's the basic question. And if you state the question in this kind of generality, the answer is trivially yes. OK, so yeah. So uh, if you can write down a problem, uh algebraically and solve it in the Turing mode uh, efficiently, what can you say about the structure of the corresponding uh, uh, corresponding uh, branch algorithm? So, so, so your question is, if we have a Turing machine algorithm for, the, for an algebraic problem, does that imply a small branching problem? So that's not clear. So um, I mean, so algebraic circuits and formulas, etc., they capture certain kinds of algorithms. So algorithms are built on you know, uh, sums and products. So if you have an algorithm that uses strange Boolean operations in some way, maybe, I don't know, looks at the bit representation of its inputs and does something, then it's not clear that it will correspond to a small circuit or branching program or any of these things. Right, so these don't capture all possible algorithms we might think of, but they do capture most natural algorithms we might think of. I mean, so, so for example, all standard algorithms for the determinate correspond to small algebraic circuits. So, yeah. Right, so, so the question was, are there polynomial families that do not have small formulas or ABPs or circuits? And it turns out that just like in the Boolean setting, you can, just by an existence argument, by counting arguments, you can prove such a thing. Okay, but these counting arguments, have to, you have to be a little careful about it. Right, so in the Boolean setting, if you recall, the way we prove uh, such a statement is that we just count the number of Boolean circuits, say, of size at most s, and that's some finite number, and then you say there are way more truth tables on n variables than that, and therefore, there must be a true table that does not correspond to a Boolean, a Boolean circuit of size at most s. Okay? So you can't quite do that here. And the reason for that is that your algebraic circuits, they could have constants from the underlying field, and the underlying field could be infinite. Okay? So you, you really have an infinite family of circuits that you're working against. So counting arguments have to be a little more subtle than that. And so you have to look at sort of infinitary, infinitary versions of counting arguments, essentially like dimension arguments, things like that. And once you do that, you can make this kind of thing work. You can show that there are polynomials, uh, random polynomials in some uh, reasonable way uh, that do not have algebraic circuits that are small. Okay, so let me state one such theorem. Okay, and this is a theorem of uh, Amir Yehudayev and Pavel Rubesh. It says that for any n and d, there are polynomials in n variables of degree at most d. Okay. These polynomials are sort of simple in the sense that the coefficients are not some crazy constants. The coefficients are all just zeros and ones. Right. And furthermore, they do not have any small circuits. Okay. So they do not have small circuits. In fact, the best you can do in order to come up with a circuit for such a polynomial is to essentially write down the trivial sigma pi representation that we talked about some time ago. Okay. So that's essentially the best you can do. So, but this is simply an existence argument. And just like in the Boolean setting, what we would like to do is to make this existence argument explicit. Okay, so that's the question for us. Are there explicit polynomials that do not have small formulas, AVP circuits? Okay, and this question turns out to be really, really interesting. Okay, and yeah, so I should probably define what explicit here means. So what is explicit? So the right kind of nice way to define explicit for us would be the complexity class V and P. And that's something that Christian spoke about in the morning, 
uh, and that's the right way to define explicit. But I'll do it in a slightly different way, which captures a special case of VNP, and which is nevertheless enough for all the lower bounds results that I'll talk about. Okay. So for me, a polynomial will be explicit, or a sequence of polynomials will be explicit, if there's essentially a small, uh, an efficient algorithm that can compute the coefficients of this polynomial. Okay. So for me, a sequence of polynomials Pn is explicit if there's a polynomial time algorithm. Here, the polynomial means polynomial in n that takes as input the number of variables n and the uh, exponents of a possible monomial that can appear in the polynomial and spits out the coefficient of this monomial in the polynomial Pn. Okay. Right. So a sequence of polynomials is explicit if there's a polynomial time algorithm that can compute the coefficients. Uh, of the monomials of this polynomial and the running time of the algorithm is polynomial in the number of variables and the size of description of this monomial. So this is a regular algorithm the Turing machine says not algebraic circuit. Right. So yeah, exactly. So this is a regular Turing machine style algorithm. Right. This could even be a Boolean circuit. Could be a Boolean circuit. Yeah, it could even be a Boolean circuit and that would be a special case of VNP. Okay. So uh, just to get your head around this definition, you should probably uh, convince yourself that standard polynomials that you know and care about, like the determinant or the permanent, definitely have this feature, right? So if I, if I give you a possible monomial of degree at most n in the n by n permanent, you can probably compute its coefficient, right? So either 0 or 1, you could compute this, right? Yes? Uh, is it important that it's Boolean, or could this be a uniform sequence of arithmetic circuits? Could you always... Oh, the, the algorithm in here? Oh, that the oh that it's a boolean circuit the, oh oh it, it's an uh, algebraic circuit so you're saying this algorithm is allowed to be an algebraic circuit but what about the constants in that circuit are they allowed to be very big so it might depend on things like that so i'm not 100 percent sure that you can allow arbitrary algebraic circuits yeah. but, uh, and it looks like you fix d here so like d is a parameter as well or is polynomial in nnd Right, it's polynomial in n and d, but for me, always d is bounded by a polynomial in n. So yeah, polynomial in n will be fine. Yeah. There's another question. This algorithm is allowed to be non-uniform. This algorithm, yeah. So this is what Amir pointed out, is allowed to be like a Boolean circuit even. Yeah. But for us, it will just be a regular Turing machine. Okay. And, and if you look at the result from the previous slide that you mentioned, that would correspond to an exponential time algorithm for this, or? Sorry. Uh, this one, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, oh, uh, would it correspond to an exponential time algorithm for picking such a polynomial? Yeah, for sure. Uh, no, I don't these think. These polynomials, are they can get new No. Shape. No, I don't or, think they can. Uh, not even an exponential time. I think even that notion of explicit is actually interesting, where you are allowed a time to write down the polynomial. And even there, we don't really have uh, okay. low bounds. Yeah. So. OK. OK, so that's the low bounds question. All right, so I'll probably tell you a little bit about what's known about this question. OK. And then uh, we'll start to get to maybe a little more interesting stuff. So what's the state of the art when it comes to proving lower bounds? Right. So we'll define three models of computation. The strongest model is the model of algebraic circuits. <coughs> okay. And for algebraic circuits, the best lower bound we have for a polynomial, an explicit polynomial in n variables of degree d, something like n times log d. Okay. So it's like n times log d. So recall that for us, d is always bounded by a polynomial in the number of variables. So the best it can be is something like n times log n. So this is slightly better than the Boolean circuit setting, where the best lower bounds are either 5 times n or 3.01 times n, depending on your choice of basis. So here things are a little bit better, but still not much better. So it's only quasi-linear. We don't even have like n squared lower bounds, quadratic lower bounds for algebraic circuits. Okay, That's the strongest model that we spoke about. What about the weakest model we spoke about? Yeah, The weakest model we defined are algebraic formulas. And the best lower bounds we have for algebraic formulas something like quadratic. Okay. All right, so even when we look at the weakest possible model that we've defined, the best lower bounds that we have are, again, just quadratic. Okay, so this state of the art is not really very good. Okay. But it turns out that much more is known when you sort of restrict the models in some way. Okay, and this is going to be sort of my focus for the rest of the talk. We're not going to be looking at general algebraic circuits or general formulas, but 
algebraic circuits or formulas or branching programs are sort of restricted in some way or the other. And these restrictions are not combinatorial like they are in the Boolean setting, not just a restriction on depth, but more like algebraic sorts of restrictions. Things like homogeneity, monotonicity, multilinearity. So, and it turns out that with uh, suitable restrictions, we are able to prove such lower bounds. Okay. And there's a large body of results of this form. And that's going to be the focus of the rest of the talk. So, Shrikant, so yeah. the, in the formulas, so circuits, the lower bounds here are sort of quantitatively better than the Boolean world, and for formulas, it's worse. So formulas, so it depends on what you compare it with. Uh, so the best formulas in the Boolean world over the full binary basis are again quadratic. Uh, I see, okay. Uh, so if you allow the, De if you only look at the De Morgan basis, it's cubic. But for the full binary basis, it's quadratic. And that sort of corresponds to the lower bound here because the techniques are very analogous. So the lower bound here, the technique used here is almost exactly the algebraic version of the technique used to prove quadratic uh, Lower bounds of formulas in the Boolean. It's not fully quadratic, right? It's n squared by log n. Or... It's n squared by log n, but I think here you do get n squared. So the difference so is exactly the same. It should be n squared by log n based on how you phrase right, it. Right, exactly. So it depends on what degrees you allow, I think. So here, yeah. So I think this is true, but yeah. Uh, if you restrict right. degrees somewhat, then it's n squared by log n. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's the all right, so that's the state of the art. But uh, so now let's go on to these sort of more restricted models for which we do know a large variety of lower bounds. And that's something I want to tell you about over the rest of. Uh... Okay. So, all right, so before I start with that, so the, the, here's the sort of philosophy that I want to get across for the rest of the talk is that most lower bounds for algebraic circuits are sort of proved using a nice generic recipe. Okay, and instantiated to various different modes of computation. And I want to tell you about this recipe. Okay. And I really feel that knowing this recipe simplifies uh, the way, uh, simplifies uh, our understanding of lower bounds for algebraic circuits in general, and simplifies at least my understanding of what's gone on in algebraic circuit complexity theory. Okay. And sort of this two-step approach is sort of, uh, is mostly, I think, at least I learned of it uh, from Amir Yehudayov's work and uh, his work with his co-authors. And so I think it's sort of due to him, though it was implicit in many other results previously also. Okay. So what is this two-step approach for proving lower bounds? Well, the first step for any sort of uh, circuit formula AVP model, the first step is what I'll call depth reduction. Okay. So what does depth reduction mean? So depth reduction means that what you do is you, so you want to prove lower bounds for a family of circuits or formulas or ABPs. What you do is first show that this, family of circuits or formulas or ABPs for which you want to prove lower bounds can be simulated in some sense by some sort of small depth circuit or formula. Okay, so you start with some ar arbitrary algebraic circuit or formula and you show that you can reduce it to a small depth circuit or formula in some particular way. Okay, and typically, typically this reduction is sort of combinatorial. So you start with your circuit or formula, you look at a gate, you say, oh, this is high degree, or this is a formula of large size within it, and you move it around and things like that. So it's a pretty combinatorial way of doing things, and you end up with a small depth circuit or formula for computing the same polynomial. Okay, and the second step is to prove lower bounds for small depth circuits or formulas. Okay, so there's always this kind of two-step approach where you first do depth reduction, and then you do lower bounds for small depth. And the second step is usually algebraic. Okay, so the first step is usually combinatorial, where you're moving around your, it's more like uh, combinatorial arguments, where you're moving around different parts of the circuit slash formula. The second step is more algebraic, where you're uh, sort of uh, defining algebraic complexity measures of your uh, small depth model of computation and showing that it's large or small. Okay, and this two-step approach is sort of a nice way of viewing most lower bounds in algebraic circuit complexity today. But I, I don't think they explain the two lower bounds that I mentioned in the previous slide. They don't explain these two, but they do explain a lot of what comes after. Okay. Yeah, so for the rest of this particular talk, until 3 o'clock, I'm going to talk about the first step of this approach, namely depth reduction. Okay. So any questions at all at this point? Okay, so great. So, uh, so what is depth reduction? So this is a sort of a very general uh, body of theorems relating to algebraic circuits or formulas. So let me state it first in a general sense and then go into specific cases of it. So here's a template for a kind of theorem that I'll call a depth reduction. So what's the template? 
right? So it basically says that any small circuit ABP or formula can be written as a small depth circuit or formula. And here for me, small, small circuit or ABP or whatever, it means polynomial sized circuit or ABP. And a small depth circuit or formula means of really, really small depth. So at most log of the size of the circuit. Okay, so uh, typically it will be log the size of the circuit, sometimes even smaller, maybe like <coughs> three or four. Okay. So any small circuit, small, so the theorem, any such theorem of this form is essentially going to say any polynomial size circuit or ABP or formula can be written as a small depth circuit or formula where the depth is at most order log n. Okay. And this statement by itself is sort of obvious because as I told you, any polynomial whatsoever can be written as a depth 2 formula. right? But what you want to do in order to prove a theorem for, of this form, for a non-trivial theorem of this form, is to ensure that when you squish the depth of these objects, you don't, you sort of still preserve some amount of structure. Okay? So it's a small depth circuit of formula, but that still has some nice properties. So this nice property might mean that you didn't blow up the size by too much. That's a nice property to have. Or it might be nice in some other structural way, which might help you in proving lower bounds. Okay? So both of these things are possible and both of these kinds of things are useful in proving lower bounds. So a depth reduction theorem for me will be any sort of theorem that fits this template. Okay. So let's uh, see a couple of uh, explicit examples. Okay. So here's uh, a well-known theorem of Brent from the 70s, which is depth reduction for formulas. Okay. So if I start with an algebraic formula of size S, right? So recall an algebraic formula is just an algebraic circuit which is a tree, right? So a priori the tree could be incredibly unbalanced and could have depth up to S. But what this theorem says is that you can always sort of rebalance this tree and move things around a little bit so that you can get its depth down to order log S while preserving the size up to a polynomial blow up, right? So any algebraic circuit of size S, I'm sorry, any algebraic formula of size S can be converted to an equivalent formula by equivalent, I mean one that computes the same polynomial of size at most a polynomial in S and depth order log S. Okay, so it's so a theorem of Brent. There's an analogous theorem for circuits. Okay, and what does that theorem say? So it's a, so this is due to Valiant, Skume, Berkowitz and Rakoff from the 80s. So what it says is that now suppose I have a size S circuit and moreover, assume that I'm, it's computing a degree D polynomial. So you have a size S circuit that's computing a degree D polynomial. Then you can convert it into an equivalent circuit computing the same polynomial of size a polynomial in S and the degree and depth that's at most logarithmic in the degree parameter. So it's log squared, log S log D. Okay, so, so the depth is at most log D in the parameter. So, uh, but if you, it really depends on whether you define circuits with bounded Fanon or not. So for me, Fanons are always unbounded, so the depth is always order log D. But if you want bounded Fanon circuits, then you would get something like log S times log D. Okay. So the runtime shouldn't matter on these, right? But like, are these conversions uh, quick? Sorry. These conversions, yeah, these conversions are efficient. And so both these theorems sort of fit this depth reduction template where you're starting with possibly an initial large depth object and ending up with a small depth object. And in all these, in both these cases, the sort of structure you preserve is that you don't blow up the size by all that much. Okay. And it turns out the theorem of roughly of this form is a very nice starting point for proving lower bounds in general. Okay. So I want to tell you a little bit about the proofs of at least one of these theorems. So I'm going to talk about the second one. Yes? So maybe your comment is that just to compare to the Boolean world, the second one is something that's really missing. Right. So, right. So, the first one is true in the Boolean world. The second one, there is no analog of that statement. And that's possibly because there's no analog of degree, uh, I don't know, of a Boolean circuit. I don't know. Okay. Right. So, but, but SAC1 by definition has small depth. So, okay. Yeah, so that's right. But the, the, friend, the, the first theorem is not, uh, not the same proof as the 
as the Boolean version, right? I mean, the Boolean version, you usually guess sort of a bit and you say it should be either 0 or 1, and I'll do computations corresponding to both. You can do that here, I think. Uh, well, it's it looks quite similar. Uh, so for Boolean functions, you can define dv to be just the... I mean, there's a natural way, right? There's a unique polynomial that represents it. So right. You can define the dv that way. Uh, so that's really a question of whether, uh, so in the Boolean world, you're not really trying to compute a syntactic object like a polynomial, right? You just want to compute some function that agrees with that polynomial on your Boolean inputs. So though you have a circuit for the Boolean function, it's not clearly, clear that it's computing this multivariate polynomial. But if you just talk about the, 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 the Boolean circuit as a, a syntactic degree. Right. So in fact, this same thing goes through. Right. So if your Boolean circuit has small syntactic degree, then the same proof would go through. But it, typically, that degree is exponential, right? I mean, for a general Boolean circuit, it could be. And so you for a general Boolean circuit, just like for a general arithmetic circuit, it, it could be. Yeah. But right here, we're trying to compute a polynomial of low degree syntactically. So you can always sort of enforce that the degrees are small. So it's really uh, enforced by the thing you're trying to compute rather than the circuit itself. Okay, so great. So we have these two depth reduction statements. I want to tell you a little bit about the second one. And instead of telling you the second one in all its detail, I'll tell you about the second one in a special case, maybe the case of algebraic branching programs. Okay, because there it's really, really clean. And the general circuit one is sort of analogous, but a little less clean. Okay, so let's try to do the second theorem, but for algebraic branching programs. So what is the theorem state? So you have a size S algebraic branching program, computing a polynomial of degree at most D, right? And the claim is that you can convert it into a circuit of polynomial in S and D size and depth only log D. Okay? And this is actually a very easy theorem to prove once you recall that algebraic branching programs actually correspond to products of matrices. Okay? And it's just like a divide and conquer algorithm for matrix multiplication. Okay? So let's just recall, let's just go through it. So recall that an algebraic branching program, the polynomial computed by it can be written as a product of matrices. The entries of the matrices are linear polynomials or zero. Okay. And so it looks something like this. And the size of these matrices is bounded by the size of the algebraic branching program. So, right? so if you have a size as branching program, this is going to be like S by S matrices at most. Okay. So you have something like this. Right? So the first step in sort of doing this thing is to sort of say that, okay, a priori I might have S many matrices in this matrix product. But really, since I'm computing a polynomial of degree at most D, I shouldn't need S many matrices. Probably D many matrices are enough. Okay. So the first step is this thing called homogenization. Okay. And uh, I'm sort of going to hand my hand wave my way through this a little bit. So we know what a homogeneous polynomial is, right? A homogeneous polynomial is one where all the monomials have the same degree. There's also a notion of a homogeneous circuit, okay, or a homogeneous formula. And roughly speaking, what these uh, cir homogeneous circuits slash formulas are are essentially circuits or formulas that never need to compute polynomials of higher degree than the degree of the output polynomial. Okay, so if you're computing a polynomial of degree D, it makes sense that you would only compute intermediate polynomials of degree at most D, and that's what homogeneous circuits slash formulas do. Okay? And similarly, you could talk about homogeneous algebraic branching programs, which sort of never compute polynomials of degree greater than D if the output polynomials of degree D. And it turns out that for algebraic branching programs and for algebraic circuits, you can sort of homogenize without incurring too much of a size blow up. Okay? So what that means in this setting is that instead of having up to S many matrices, you can ensure that you have at most D many matrices in this matrix product. Okay? You pay a little bit in the size of the matrices. S goes to something like S times D. But since I think of D as reasonably small, I'm going to ignore this blow up. Okay, so you can always reduce an algebraic branching program to one where there are at most D matrices in the matrix product. Okay. All right, so that's sort of step one of this process. And then it's very, very easy. So suppose you have a product of D matrices that you want to compute, right? And you want to do this in small depth. So natural thing to do is sort of do divide and conquer. Right? So you take these D matrices, break them into two blocks of size D over two, right? The product of the first block is going to be a row vector. Right? I'm starting with a row vector and then I have a bunch of matrices. So the product of all these matrices is going to be a row vector. Okay? The entries of this row vector are going to be some polynomials P1 through Ps. Right? 
And similarly, the product of the last d by 2 matrices, since this is a column vector here, the product of the last d by 2 matrices is going to be a column vector. And the entries of that column vector are going to be some polynomials q1 through qs. Okay. And the polynomial corresponding to the entire matrix product is sort of going to be the inner product of these two vectors. Right. So you just break it up into two blocks of size d over 2, compute the first product, compute the second product, take the product of these two matrices, which corresponds to the inner product of between these two vectors, and that will be the output polynomial. Right? And that gives you this kind of basic identity. Okay? So you have, uh, if you have an ABP uh, of size S, right, it can be decomposed in this way. So the polynomial computed by the ABP is a sum of S polynomials, where P1 through PS are the polynomials computed in the first as the product of the first d by 2 matri uh, matrices, and q1 through qs are the polynomials that occur in the, when you compute the product of the last d by 2 matrices. And now you just recursively apply this procedure, so, right? so this gives you a sort of the beginnings of a circuit, and you sort of recursively apply this procedure to get the overall circuit. Okay. Okay. So that's the divide and conquer algorithm. And if you repeat this process, obviously there are going to be something like log d levels of recursion, and you're going to get a circuit of depth order log d. So, so you need to apply the homogeneity again, right? No? Or right. So at this point, it's already homogeneous, right? Because. Uh, no, but the intermediate ones may not be. Okay. Right. So, uh, okay. So I should say that all I need at the next level is that I have at most d by 2 matrices and they're computing a polynomial of degree at most d by 2. So I don't really need to apply this homogeneity idea again and again, right? So the only thing we, we use in sort of saying that this thing uh, stops with the log d levels of recursion is that oh, we start with d matrices, then we have d by 2, d by 4, etc. So all that matters is that we start with d matrices. It doesn't matter later whether it's homogeneous or not. Okay, great. Okay, so that's uh, the basic depth reduction theorem. It's extremely simple. You can do something like this for circuits, but that's significantly more complicated. And uh, I'll say a little bit about it, maybe in a couple of slides, but not much. Okay, but I want to uh, sort of stare at this proof for a little bit and gain more from it than just the statement of the depth reduction that we've written down. And in particular, I want to stare at this uh, interesting identity that we sort of uh, wrote down during the course of the proof. And already I claim that it's, this identity is quite interesting. Okay, so let's call this sort of the basic identity for ABPs. Okay. So what is the basic identity for ABPs telling us? Well, if you have an ABP A of size S computing a polynomial of degree at most D, then this ABP can be written as a small sum. So assume that S is small, like polynomial in N, right? So then this ABP can be written as a small sum of terms, each of which is a product of two polynomials of degree at most d over 2. Okay, So you have an ABP which is computing a polynomial degree at most d. Any such ABP can be written as a small sum of products of polynomials of degree at most d over 2. And I claim that this is already quite a bit of structure on the ABP. Okay, So in particular, a random polynomial does not have this kind of decomposition. Okay, so already in principle, this basic identity should be enough for us to prove lower bounds. Okay, so if you want to sort of see this more formally, what you can do is you can start with this ABP, so this, this basic identity, and sort of just from this basic identity, derive a very, very small circuit, with much smaller than for a random polynomial, a small circuit for this ABP. Yeah, how will you do that? Well, you just forget about the fact that these PIs and QIs had small ABPs. Okay, so you write down the basic identity. So A is a sum over I of PI times QI. And all you know about the PIs and QIs for now are that they're polynomials of degree at most D over 2. Right? So these polynomials of degree at most D over 2 have some sort of trivial representation. Right? So you write down that trivial representation. And what you're going to get is something like a depth 4 formula. So it's going to be a sum of products of sums of products. So it's going to be a depth 4 formula. Okay. So depth, this depth 4 formula is not very small okay, because we've written out trivial representations for these things, but it's sort of non-trivially small right? because these are not generic polynomials of degree d, but they're generic polynomials of degree d over 2. So the trivial representation is a little bit smaller. 
okay so just from this basic identity what you can do is you can come up with a depth 4 formula which is sort of non trivially small okay and since we've seen that random polynomials do not have any circuit that's sort of non trivially small it should imply that this is not a property that holds for random polynomials okay so already this basic identity is imposing some sort of structure on the polynomial computer by the ABP, which is in principle enough to prove lower bounds. Okay. It's just that we don't know how to use it to prove lower bounds yet. All right. Okay. So, so it turns out that, uh, okay, so this is one way of reducing an ABP to depth four, but it turns out that if you want to actually reduce the depth, not just to log D, but to depth four, something like this, you can do something better. Okay, from by just following the same strategy, which is that instead of breaking up things into two blocks of size d over two, you break things up to, into many blocks, let's say k blocks of size d over k. Okay, and you can do things that are slightly better. So you break things up into k blocks of size d over k, and now inside each of these blocks, you're computing products of d over k matrices, which you can sort of do with a trivial representation. And now overall you have to compute the product of something like k matrices, which again you can do with a trivial representation. And if you sort of optimize the value of k, right, as, as k, in, when k is very, very small, then the top part is small. When k is very, very large, then the top part becomes very big, but the bottom part becomes very small. So if you sort of optimize the value of k, you can prove something pretty interesting. Okay, and this interesting thing is as follows. So if you start with an ABP of size s computing a polynomial of degree d, you can write it out as a depth 4 formula. We call depth 4 here means sigma pi, sigma pi. So sums of products of sums of products. Okay. And this polynomial, this sort of formula for the ABP has size at most s to the square root d. Okay. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big formula, but it's non-trivially small. It's in fact significantly smaller than the depth 4 formula I outlined in the previous slide. Okay, so this is a sort of a non-trivial reduction to depth four uh, for ABPs. And this statement has a following very nice consequence, right? It says that if you want to prove super polynomial lower bounds, let's say, I don't know, for the permanent, for example. Okay. So what this tells you is that if the permanent has polynomial sized formulas, I'm sorry, polynomial sized ABPs, then it has a depth four formula of size n to the square root n. Okay, because S is now polynomial and the degree is now N. So the N by N permanent, if it has a polynomial sized ABP, then it in fact has a depth four formula of size N to the root N. Okay, which means to prove a super polynomial lower bound for the permanent, for general, so for ABPs, it suffices to prove a better than N to the root N lower bound in this very restrictive depth four formula setting. Okay, so it's a very interesting statement that holds in the algebraic setting and I don't know quite as strong a statement in the Boolean world, right? So this really sets apart the algebraic and the Boolean worlds from each other. So any questions about the statement of this theorem? So, so generically, with just k as a parameter, this is s to the k is a size. Right, average. generically with k as a parameter, the, yeah, the top thing will be s to the k, but the bottom part will be of size s to the d over k. And so okay. it's in, the product of these things. Right, right, right. Sorry, uh, I should have written here. Yeah. So this entire thing, it's in fact not just the top part that has size s to the root d, it's the entire thing that has size s to the root d. And that wouldn't be true if you took k to be very small. If you took k to be quite small, then the bottom part would be. Okay, good. All right, so I've got about five minutes left. So let me tell you a little bit about the circuit depth reduction. As I said, this is not just a result that holds for ABPs, but for general circuits. Tell you a little bit about that. Okay. So again, the circuit depth reduction is the following statement. So if you have a circuit of size S computing a polynomial of degree at most T, it can be converted into an equivalent circuit, again of polynomial in S and D size, and depth just log the degree. Okay. And how would the proof of such a statement go? It's all very analogous to the divide and conquer algorithm for ABPs that we've already seen, but just slightly a little bit different. So what we did for ABPs is we started with these D matrices and we sort of just broke them into two blocks of size D over two each. There is no analogous uh, sort of uh, immediately analogous thing you can do here. But what you can do is, well, first of all, you homogenize. And then what you do is you find gates in the circuit 
that roughly compute polynomials of degree d over 2. Okay. So you find all the gates in the circuit that compute polynomials of degree roughly d over 2. Okay. And the, the, the polynomials computed by these gates sort of correspond to the product of the first d by 2 matrices in the ABP setting. So you start with this kind of thing, and then you note that you have a version of the basic identity that we had for ABPs, but for circuits now, right? So what you can say is that the circuit can be written as a sum of a few terms, where each term is the product of one of these gates, and sort of a der the derivative of the circuit with respect to this gate, okay? So this is very imprecise. I'm not trying to make this precise, but this is roughly what you do. So these GIs are the gates in the circuit that compute polynomials of degree roughly d over 2. And you can write the polynomial computed by the circuit as the sum over i, gi times the derivative of the circuit with respect to gi. Okay? And that's sort of the analog of the last d by 2 matrices in the ABP world. Right? And now you can start with this basic identity and recurse and you get the whole thing. Okay? So it's a very uh, vague uh, outline, but that's all I'm going to do. When you say roughly d over 2, you mean between d over 3 to 2 d over 3? Right, it's between d over 3 to 2 d over 3. Well, it's it's not even exactly that. It's it's just slightly more than d over 2. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. They're not necessarily all gates between d over 3 and 2 d over 3, but there's something like... Yeah, actually, I don't entirely remember, so let me not say uh, something wrong. Yeah, I think there are gates uh, roughly all of whose children are definitely less than d over 2, but they are not of degree d over 2, maybe. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, so you get some version of a basic identity for circuits. And again, this basic identity in principle is sufficient to prove lower bounds. Uh, but we don't know how to use it to prove lower bounds. Okay. Right. So that's the circuit depth reduction. And just like for ABPs, we could reduce ABPs not just to depth... Uh, log d, we could also reduce them to depth 4 with sort of a sub-exponential blob. And we have a similar statement for circuits. Uh, so this was pointed out by Agrawal and Vinay starting in 2008. But the tight parameters that I'm stating here were obtained by Tavernas in 2013. So again, just like before, if you have a size s circuit computing a degree d polynomial, you can convert it into a sigma pi sigma pi formula, so a depth 4 formula, of size s to the root d. Okay, it's not quite a trivial blob, something sub-exponential, right? And again, you have this interesting kind of uh, result for algebraic circuits. If you want to show that the permanent does not have polynomial-sized algebraic circuits in general, it suffices to show that the n by n permanent does not have these very restrictive depth 4 formulas of size n to the root n. Okay, so this seemingly weak model, proving strong enough lower bounds for the seemingly weak model, implies the whole thing. It's very interesting. And so one last result I'll mention before stopping is uh, an even more recent depth reduction result, which is uh, extremely interesting. Uh, this is due to Gupta, uh, Kamath, Kayal, and Saptarishi. Uh, so just after the previous ones. It says that you can, you can even reduce one layer further. So not just sigma pi, sigma pi, but to sigma pi, sigma. So, right? so just sums of products of linear functions, again, with the same kind of uh, size, size s to the root d. Okay, uh, this requires the field to have characteristic zero, but that's not really such an important thing. It's still an amazing result. Uh, it's an amazing result, but it's not quite as sort of useful seemingly for lower bounds as this one, because in some sense, while these formulas are more complicated, they have one depth more, they're somewhat simpler in the sense that they have nice structural properties, like homogeneity properties that these formulas don't, okay? So yeah, so we have both these kind of depth reduction results and proving strong lower bounds for either of these models would suffice to prove general super polynomial lower bounds. But somehow these formulas are slightly not as well behaved as these ones. So perhaps still this is the right way to go. Okay. All right, so that's all I had to say about this. So the, now the question is, can we prove lower bounds for small depth formulas of circuits? And strong enough lower bounds will imply uh, strong lower bounds for general formulas. Questions before the word. So this depth reduction that you do, you take some, you take an object and you give a restrictive model for it. If I ask for an approximation, can you do better? 
Oh, uh, this is an approximation in the, in the sense that Christian was talking about in the morning. Uh, so, I don't know, right? So, uh, but, you know, I can consult an oracle. So, Mrinal possibly <laughs> knows, so you can ask him. <laughs> So one of the things we care about for death is the trade-off between top and the formal degree. And you can get approximate death reduction results where the top and is smaller. You can get small trade-offs there, while if you want exact death reduction, some of the parameters that GKK has used is the best. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see if we have an hour.